10 Things to Know About Interest Groups What is an interest group? Interest group is an organization of individuals who share a common political goal, seek to influence public policy decisions, and unite for that specific purpose. An interest group must have all three of these parts. One by itself is not going to make it an interest group. So a group has to come together and have a specific political goal, but if they don't come together to influence public policy decisions, like how members of Congress vote or how they debate on a certain topic, then they wouldn't necessarily be an interest group. Likewise, they have to come together and unite for the specific purpose of influencing public policy. Who are interest groups? There are many examples of interest groups. Some of them have names, some of them don't. Some of them you've heard before just referred to as kind of nebulous terms, the religious right, big business, or big pharma. Others, you actually can put names on organizations, and these organizations have specific uh, parts of them which act as interest groups coming together in order to promote certain public policy goals. You can think of the AARP or the NAACP, or even the Sierra Club. Oftentimes, you'll hear about interest groups when you're listening to political ads or um, listening to different particular policy statements put out by groups. And they will say, for example, this is backed by um, the nurses union or uh, the te you know, national union of teachers or certain environmentalist groups or certain institutes, etc. Interest groups have symbiotic relationships. What that means is that they give something and then they get something in return of equal or greater value. People join the interest groups, so that's the group of the people with the arrow to the interest groups. The interest groups then go and influence the government. And in return, the government gives things to the interest groups that the interest groups want, which of course are made up of their particular individuals who contribute to them. So this symbiotic relationship actually uh, generates this relations between these individual groups. And it's very important the relationship which the interest groups have both with their members and with the government. Because if any of this cycle is broken, then the interest group is ineffective. And the best interest groups, the ones which are most effective when it comes to influencing public policy, are the ones that have these unbroken cycles and are not only good at one side of the equation, but are good at the other side as well. So what are the roles of interest groups? There are six different broad categories of what interest groups do. Number one is representation. This sounds kind of what, uh, like what you know, re elected representatives do in terms of representing their constituents. Representation by interest groups is when they represent members to Congress, persuade policymakers to hear concerns of the members, etc. So in other words, just like your congressperson it represents you, you can have be part of an interest group, uh, say, you know, the American Cancer Society, and the American Cancer Society can go in and say um, that, well, we are representing people who have this specific interest. Or the Save the Whales Association. This is, uh, we are going to talk to the members of Congress and try to get them to understand that our members of our particular interest group have this interest, and we want you to hear out their concerns. Number two is participation. Interest groups provide a unique avenue for regular people who vote, uh, voters to come in and actually give their input to what's going on with their elected officials outside of elections. We already talked about how you can hold different elected officials accountable by choosing not to elect them in a future election, but what do you do in the meantime when you already have them in office? Well, interest groups provide one way to participate. You can pool your resources and channel efforts for collective action through interest groups. And oftentimes, the interest groups have the time, they have the money, and they have the ability to bring your concerns to the forefront with your participation. Number three is education. Interest groups are actually great at educating policymakers about issues. The Save the Whales Foundation, for example, 
would know much more about whales and saving them than probably any member of Congress. And so if a bill comes up where there's going to be issues about saving whales, then the Save the Whales Association can go in and educate the different members as to what their vote would mean, whether a vote for the bill would be a good thing or whether it would be a bad thing and why. Number four is agenda building. Interest groups use agenda building to get issues on the political agenda and make them a high priority for action. Just like we were talking about with political parties, how they kind of build the political agenda, this is one of those things where they can go in and say, we know that there's a bill that's coming up, a uh, member of Congress, and we want you to take this very seriously and really act on this one quickly because this is very important to our members. And of course, the more that they hear this, uh, the more likely that the member will be to actually consider moving forward on something if they believe that there is a large constituency behind that issue who wants something done in a certain way. Number five is provision of program alternatives. They can give proposals for how an issue should be dealt with after it's put on the agenda. So perhaps they weren't the one who put something on the agenda. They didn't say, hey, you don't have a bill on Save the Whales, but you should. But instead, there's another bill that came, comes up about Save the Pandas, and Save the Whales has an idea of how that issue should be dealt with. It's already on the agenda. It's something that's being talked about by the policymakers. So what do they want to have happen with this? And this is another form of influence they can use, telling the member how they want them to vote, how they want them to react to a particular issue that is already there. And number six is program monitoring. Uh, and that is keeping tabs on the consequences and the effects of the law. So laws, so, you, know, you, you begin the process when we're talking about how a bill becomes a law, and you begin the process of putting these things into action, then finally you get this bill, you get this law put into place, hooray, it's all done. But is anybody checking to see if that law actually did anything good? Or if it's failing? Or if it didn't actually address or create a solution to the problem that was there in the first place? Well, actually, there are interest groups who pay attention to such things. They keep tabs on the consequences, the effects of the laws. They oftentimes have a lot of research and analysis, which goes into that. And then they can bring that back to, again, providing program alternatives, providing um, different amendments to different laws, and using their particular abilities to influence how they're going to, um, how the members are going to create or react to that certain problem or ad adapt something which they did before which didn't necessarily go well. Of course, how do they do this? We'll talk about this in a minute. It's not only talking, it's not only information. Of course, it's a lot of money. Uh, how do you get someone's ear that is running for election or that uh, is in a is in a elected position? Well, of course, they're going to need the money to run again or they're going to need the money in order to keep their constituency happy. And so oftentimes, being able to pool all of those resources together, as we saw with participation, is really a key thing. Because if you can get all of that money together and say, hey, we're from Save the Whales. We're not sure how much you've thought about the whales lately. But um, we may be able to kick some money your way or be able to build part of your campaign or help you out or put in a good word for you um, campaigning with our folks in our jurisdiction, if you can show them just how much you care about the fact that they care about the whales, or so to speak. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer because I'm not a lobbyist because I'm not getting uh, that particular message across in, in a very effective way, but that's generally the idea, is how do we get the interest group uses all of these different tactics in order to influence the way that government works through its members. Number five, how are interest groups different? Well, they differ by their shared common goal, of course. So they have different issues and different ideologies. Um, the National Rifle Association, of course, cares about rifles and cares about gun control and gun safety and things like that. Whereas maybe the NAACP it doesn't care as much about guns, but cares about some other particular issue. But there are also different types of interest groups. Three types of interest groups that I want to talk about economic interest groups particularly deal with money issues so your interest group is specifically around something that has to do with finances or cash lowering the taxes 
raising the wages for low-income workers, some sort of farm subsidy, for example, for uh, farm workers, farmers in California who are growing vegetables, uh, favorable regulations for trade, that type of stuff. Second type of group would be equal opportunity interest groups. And these interest groups are less interested in money issues and more interested in civil rights issues. So they're going to bring uh, issues of unrepresented groups or economic rights to the foreground of the members' attentions. And then we have public interest groups. They focus on non-economic issues. So collective goods, we're talking about uh, general things that everybody benefits from, so to speak. So clean air and clean water, uh, peace across the land, human rights internationally. Uh, they also deal with some things that maybe not everybody benefits from or not everybody agrees about, but they're also kind of um, have a, a different kind of collective personality to them. So, for example, abortion rights, marijuana rights, um, marriage rights, those types of things. Included in the public interest group section are government interest groups. Government interest groups have two flavors, foreign government interest groups and domestic uh, government interest groups having to deal with either foreign policy or domestic policy. Of course, the foreign policy interest groups are going to, for example, affect the way that we um, deal with trade policy with another country. How do we want to have a stance against, say, a country that we are concerned has nuclear weapons? Domestic policy really has to do with federal policy here at home and how we want to work with how the different federal policies um, within, you know, public policy realms within the, um, with, within the federal sphere. So what do interest groups have to give? Well, first off, it's important to know that they give things to different people. We talked about some of the ways that you can, that, that, well, things that they do before a couple slides back. So let's talk about what they have to give. I mentioned a couple of these before. Money being the, the very big number one, because although money doesn't necessarily buy everything, if you're an interest group that has no money, it's pretty much guaranteed that you will get nothing done. Money provides a lot of things. Uh, it's, it's not only for specifically donating to candidates, but they can pay for well-trained staff. They can pay for professional assistance. They can pay for managers who are sitting there running the thing. They can pay for research and development. They can pay for a whole lot of um, you know, paraphernalia and advertising and brochures and pamphlets and all of that good stuff. Uh, important to know when you're dealing with money is our political action committees. These are called PACs. You may have heard of them or super PACs. PACs are just the fundraising arms of interest groups. So they're the ones who deal with all of the money part of the interest group. Uh, so important to know when you're, when you're saying, okay, well, wait a second. So these interest groups now are, are raising money and using money to influence people. Is that something that's okay? Well, the Supreme Court has decided that it is. The Supreme Court has ruled that money is actually a form of free speech and that corporations can actually be individuals for the purpose of using money as free speech. However, there are limits that can be given. The Supreme Court has said there's a $5,000 limit on donations to candidates. So even if you have a political action committee coming together on behalf of an interest group, they can only give $5,000 to the candidate, a candidate directly. So say we want to elect Susan Smith, we can only give Susan Smith $5,000 from the Save the Whales PAC. Now, of course, that doesn't l completely limit what Save the Whales can do for Susan Smith, particularly since a Supreme Court decision which came down in 2010 called Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, often referred to simply as Citizens United. What this case did is it removed limits on political expenditures. Now, political expenditures are different from political donations or contributions to a candidate. Contributions to a candidate, you just throw money directly at the candidate and they can spend it any way they want to help get themselves elected. Political expenditures, on the other hand, are you're spending money more kind of on their behalf. If you happen to spend your money on something and it happens to benefit a particular candidate, well, that can't be said that you were giving money directly to them. And so 
with that decision, the Citizens United decision, we really have a huge loophole in which PACs can kind of go around this campaign finance issue of the $5,000 limit and go on with political expenditures which don't have a limit on them right now. And so they can do a whole lot of issue advocacy, they can do a whole lot of um, really putting out there what their ideas are on particular people, of particular topics, without having that particular regulation. And this is one of the reasons that interest groups really dominate in the political sphere, and that's because they have these sufficient resources. Uh, just you or I, um, and our personal fortunes, or lack thereof, might not have the ability to have a trained staff and uh, a full office running of people whose job it is to make sure that what we want done in the world gets to the ears of our legislators. But we don't have the ability to do that because we don't have the resources. Well, interest groups do, and that's what they do and why they exist. And so one thing that they can definitely give to the government officials is money and those resources. Second thing is leadership. They can organize even without other resources. Um, of course, the, the big PACs and the big interest groups that we're dealing with normally now uh, are all about the money, but there have been issues in the past where it really was all about the leadership. If you can remember Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, really that didn't have to do a whole lot with money. It had to do with organization. It had to deal with um, a st strong and charismatic leader coming forward, presenting an agenda, and co using that agenda to influence the way that public policy ran in this country. Another thing that they can contribute is membership. Just straight up size. And also, straight up intensity of the people who subscribe to them. For example, the AARP, Association of Retired Persons, has 35 million members and growing every day. And those people, when you have the AARP who represents 35 million people, remember that representation piece, knocking at a, a person's door, an elected, elected member's door, saying, hey, We'd like to talk to you. We 35 million people would like to speak with you about something we find that's important. Then oftentimes you're going to have their ear. Also, you can look at membership intensity. When you get a political action committee, when you that is or and an interest group which is around a very specific topic, then they're generally known to be the ones to go to for that specific topic, particularly for education. Uh, also, you have. Um, you have interest groups which, because they are dedicated and focused to one particular topic, they can be pretty intense. And so those are the ones, for example, this is where I have uh, the NRA listed on gun control matters. When the NRA has their members riled up about gun control, Congress and members of Congress are going to listen about it because they know that that membership has that intensity around that particular issue. Interest groups also have information to give. They collect studies, uh, they do, sorry, conduct studies, they collect data on the impact of the law and the regulations. They're really the ones doing all of the homework. If you think about what an elected official does with their day, they really don't have a whole lot of time to go and uh, read in-depth studies on how to save the whales. Nor do they have time to compare different studies across, um, across different states or whatever have you about um, how, some, how a particular problem could be solved. But what they do have are different interest groups who have the time and the money to do that and who can provide them with some sort of concise information which they can use to help make their decision. Interest groups also give things back to their members. Like I said, we have a symbiotic relationship going on. Three specific things, or three categories we can divide that into. Number one is material benefits. They give the members information. This is what's going on with your elected officials. This is where they are on a particular bill. This is where we're moving, and this is where movement needs to take place. Number two are solidarity benefits. The benefit of being able to interact and bond with other people who think like you and have similar goals and want to bring certain issues to the foreground. And then, of course, number three, expressive benefits, which is the benefit of simply being able to do something you strongly believe in. This goes back to the unite definition of, 
um, of interest groups, that part of it that we saw in the very first slide. They're really coming together, uniting for this specific purpose, and that's an expressive benefit in and of itself. Number seven, so what do interest groups want, and what do they actually get? Well, we talked about this idea of pluralist democracy before, that this is how you actually get people the representation that they want, is by coming together in groups. And so when you seek to influence public policy decisions, uh, it goes that if you do it in a group, you're going to be much more effective. And so interest groups want to influence. They want to influence the way that members vote. They want to influence the way that public policy is created and the way that it runs. And we want to influence what government does by capitalizing on Americans' tendency to form these groups. Which brings us to how do they actually get this influence? Uh, intro to lobbying. Lo all lobbying is is this idea of influence. When you're influencing people who actually have the decision-making power. So, for example, you have... Uh, a representative of the AARP going and speaking to a member of Congress who has the vote on a bill that will either shorten or lengthen the Social Security um, Social Security payment cycle. That's something which would be, for example, direct lobbying. Lobbying got its name because there, in if you go around, um, if you go around Congress, if you kind of what would were to walk around the legislative halls in DC there are and actually if you go around most um, capitol buildings there's there are lobbies there are areas between the members offices and where they actually go to the floor now because the lobbyists are not actually able to go into restricted places within the Capitol sometimes. They'll wait in this lobby to try to catch the members of Congress or the members of the state Senate or who, whatever body it is to talk to them and influence them between the, between the door of their office and the door where they're going to vote. So that's kind of where the name came from. And there are two types of lobbying that I want you to know about. Direct lobbying and indirect lobbying, which we'll talk about in a minute. So direct lobbying is just this face-to-face -face interaction. It's catching Senator Smith in the hallway on the way to cast her vote and saying, Senator Smith, you know, there's this, there's a Save the Whales bill that uh, Senator Upton has put on for a vote next weekend. I'd really like to give you some information about it. I'm from Save the Whales. Here's my card. Uh, and that type of face-to-face -face interaction, or I'd like to set up a lunch with you or meet with you. And... Of course, lobbying is not restricted to Congress. It's not restricted to the legislative branch at all. Of course, they do do it in Congress. Um, you have the committees. Bills are written and revised by lobbyists. They come in already and say, you know, um, the Save the Pandas bill hasn't been written yet, but there should be one. And I know that you are the type of person who would champion Save the Pandas, so guess what? We at the Save the Pandas Association have written a bill, and we think that you would be the perfect person to sponsor that bill. And so they'll actually write bills and do things for the congressperson or their staff in order to help ease that process along. Of course, they develop many relationships with the committees uh, and their staff in order to uh, work with them easily. Lobbyists often host a lot of meetings. They spend a lot of money on parties and lunches and going and uh, schmoozing where they know that people of influence are going to be. Because, of course, their job is to influence the people who have that decision-making power. So you've got to find them, you've got to wine them and dine them, you've got to do whatever it takes to get your message across. Of course, we mentioned before providing information, uh, testifying at different hearings, for example, or committee hearings on different Expert, uh, different um, things which require a certain amount of expertise. And, of course, you know, money is another thing, too. How do they get into this area? Well, I'll tell you that one of the, one of the most successful groups of people who come in as lobbyists come in through something called the revolving door. What the revolving door means is that a lobbyist 
might have been a former member of Congress, or they might have been another executive official who was high enough ranked up there that they already have the contacts. They already know the people. They already know where everybody goes at 6 o'clock, uh, which bar they go to at the end of a day. And so they're already plugged in. They have already have the business cards. People already know them and want to talk to them or want to or are able to trust them and so now they're coming back in other words went out the door because they're no longer elected come right back in the door uh, as a lobbyist and all of a sudden they're there as the representative for save the pandas and they may have a different job but the people still know who they are and so they're able to effectively influence the people who have decision making power because even though they themselves no longer have decision-making power, they still have those connections to people. And then, of course, they assist in building coalitions. Outside of the legislative branch, definitely there's lobbying to influence the presidency and the bureaucracy. There's actually an office of a public liaison. And that purpose, person's job, or that office's job, is to mobilize support for the administration's policies. So they're really a whole office of of lobbyists, professional lobbyists who do this. They affect rulemaking and uh, regulating agencies, lobbyists do, I mean. So not only, you know, we talked about in, when we talked about the bureaucracy, this whole world of rules and regulations which are created outside of the legislative sphere and created in the executive sphere. Well, there are lobbyists for that too. If there are going to be regulations that talk about uh, how many parts per million of carbon can be in the air, for example, then you better believe there are lobbyists who are going to be at those regulators' desks and outside their offices to help influence them on that particular rulemaking. They also get hired by agencies looking for experts, which is, uh, of course, very uh, important to the way that they are able to get their specific point across. Even courts have their own lobbyers. Uh, we call them lawyers. And they don't necessarily lobby in the same way that they're trying to, um, well, I guess they do try to influence the decision maker. They try to influence the decision maker through their arguments. And the way that lawyers lobby, quote unquote, is that they challenge the legality of laws or regulations. So you will have, for example, interest groups who employ hordes of lawyers. And these lawyers, it's their job to attack a bad law, try to get it appealed, try to get it up to a higher court, and convince the trier of fact or convince that judge that that's a bad law and get it overturned, or convince the judge to make a good law so that that actually changes policy. And you can think about the Sierra Club or Common Cause most interest groups uh, have you know, a legal department that is going to be looking out for the creation of bad law and the overturning of bad law, as well as what types of cases they can bring up to make good law to help them later on. They also draft something called amicus briefs, which are, they may not be particularly within a lawsuit itself, but they want to help influence how the judge thinks about that lawsuit by filing a brief on the law, which is, includes, their, of course, their argument for how that law should be interpreted. And so we get to indirect lobbying. Indirect lobbying is also very important. It's not thought of as much. You just don't get kind of the glitz and glamour and money that we think of when we think of direct lobbying. But indirect lobbying is huge, and it's becoming even more huge as we really go into the digital era. It's using public opinion to put pressure on policymakers. So in this particular sphere, we are looking to educate the public, to conduct extensive research, to court the media and public relations firms, for example. This is where you're running issue advocacy ads. So you're running ads that are saying, you know, this particular issue is very important. Go and tell your senator that this issue is very important. And so you see these on the internet, you see YouTube campaigns, you see television commercials. And the idea here is you really want to motivate individual voters to go out to talk to politicians themselves, to actually be their own lobbyists in a way, to say, hey, we will vote for you or not vote for you, depending on how you react to this particular issue, which is of importance and interest to us. So we have people who go and they write letters, they send emails, they do petition drives, they fax, they phone call, um, they do social protests, they do uh, Twitter feeds that go on forever. Interesting thing, though, about this, 
And I will say this, having worked in a congressperson's office, it's always the same folks who are calling and writing. I don't know why, but they're always the same group of people who are plugged in. And they have some pretty interesting things to say. A lot of people just assume that somebody out there is saying what they want them to say. Somebody out there is representing their interests. But if you really are specifically interested in a topic, I highly encourage you to get a hold of your representatives and let them know. Because, um, trust me, the, the one person who's ringing the phone off the hook saying that there should be M&Ms in every vending machine and this is a very important issue to him might not represent the entire constituency or the things that are very important to you. Number nine, who directs interest groups? So who's in charge? This is a sticky question because there are a couple of different ways that this can go, but I want to show you two um, very kind of black and white issues here, ignoring all of the shades of gray for the purposes of this quick discussion. First is called grassroots lobbying. You've heard of this before. It's lobbying which springs up directly from the people. This is what moveon.org claims to be. And the idea here is that ordinary people in their roles as citizens without a ton of money, without a ton of influence, without a ton of experience trying to influence their government, come together in order to say this is something elected official which is really important to us and we want to influence you to vote a certain way or to act a certain way. Contrast this to astroturf lobbying. If you don't know what astroturf is, astroturf is that fake grass stuff that you see in many golf courses that's kind of on the ground and like torn up in certain places. That's what AstroTurf is. So it's kind of fake grass lobbying, I guess you could think of it as that. This is when you have front groups that try to mimic grassroots lobbying, but it really didn't come from the people. It came from this group that's pretending to be the people. So you can think of, for example, um, when Big Pharma did its push against the import importing of cheap drugs from Canada. They made it seem like it was this huge uh, swelling of people that was saying, we really don't want this, but it was really funded by a big group. It was orchestrated by an elite group of people and actually by an interest group with, with quite a bit of money who just tried to make it look like it was more of a grassroots, uh, grassroots uh, campaign when actually the interest that was actually directed by a much bigger lobbying group. And number 10, the, the million dollar question is, is all of this good or bad, or several millions or billion, billions if you're talking about lobbyists? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not going to say if it is good or bad, but give you a couple of things to think about. Number one is this idea of one person, one vote. So if lobbyists come together and you're saying, well, these people are able to influence based on all of this money the way that my elected official votes, does that mean that their vote is worth more than mine because my vote is only one and these people with more money or more influence actually have the person's ear who actually makes the decision making? Uh, this has been a problem. It's been a question. And it's been the subject of several attempts to limit lobbying power over the years. In 1995, we had the Lobbying Disclosure Act. And this requires that lobbyists report how much they're paid who pays them, and what issues they're promoting. And so you can actually look up a registry and figure out how much they're paid a lot, who pays them, so which group they're actually advocating for, which interest, interest group, which super PAC, um, etc., and what they're working on at that moment. And then in 2007, we had the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act. What this did is it tightened traveling gift restrictions on lobbyists. Uh, on lobbyists trying to provide travel and free meals to members of Congress or other elected officials. In other words, remember elected officials are always hurting to try to get money to get reelected. It's just a fact of elections. And so if somebody said, if a lobbyist were to come in and say, hey, you know, I know you don't have a whole lot of time, but I also know that you need to fly to Detroit tomorrow. How about if I take you and my interest group's private jet to Detroit you won't have to pay a dime, but we can talk on the way. Well, this might be something that's very interested to an elected official who maybe doesn't have the cash to fly to Detroit but needs to be there. And all it would cost is, you know, a couple hours in a plane with a lobbyist. So that may be something that they would consider. And so there was legislation which was passed to try to tighten these restrictions, uh, travel and 
gifts. Uh, you can imagine what different gifts might be given uh, to an elected official. Um, to make the way that they are actually influenced uh, more transparent, kind of bringing that to light. Of course, you can imagine why limiting interest groups is difficult. Not only do they have all the money, they represent a lot of people, and thinking about the 35 million plus that are with the AARP, for example, not the easiest thing to do. Also, because we saw just how much, how many benefits you actually get that the members of Congress, who would be the ones making these limitations, get from the lobbyists. Not only do they get this money, but they get a lot of information. They get educated. They get uh, someone who they can call up and say, hey, there's this smoking bill that's coming on my desk. I need to know everything that I can know about secondhand smoke, and you're the experts. And so they have a way to get a lot of information in a short amount of time. They have ways to uh, reach out to certain constituencies. And really, you have that back and forth of that symbiotic relationship. And so uh, there are points on either side of the whether it's a good or bad thing. For right now, it is just a thing. It's just something important to know because it is a huge part of our political process. And it's a huge part also of elections, which we're going to be talking about shortly, how people get elected, how they stay in office, and how they do business while they're in office. So it's important to know how interest groups play into all of that, particularly as we try to exercise ways to move forward as efficient citizens in influencing members of Congress, influencing our elected officials in the different issues that are of importance and interest to us.